Welcome everyone, so great to have you all here. I'm Daniel Aiken and welcome to this special episode of the Wisdom Dharma Chats. It's a special episode because we're joined by not one, but two amazing guests from two different Buddhist traditions. So let me first introduce Yonge Mingyu Rinpoche. Rinpoche is a popular Buddhist teacher known around the world for his engaging teaching style. He's not only completed the traditional Buddhist training in philosophy and psychology, but since he was quite young, Rinpoche has spent many years in strict retreat. Most recently, he completed a wandering retreat through the Himalayas and the plains of India that lasted four and a half years. So welcome Rinpoche and thank you for joining us. Thank you. So now to introduce, so now to introduce Bhikkhu Analyo. Uh, Bhikkhu Analyo is a scholar monk and popular Buddhist teacher. He completed a PhD thesis on the Satipatthana Sutta, and this work inspired interest in early Buddhism, which became the main area of his academic research. I can see Bhante asking me to cut this short, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little bit. Specifically, uh, he focused on the topics of meditation and women in Buddhism. He's since retired from his position as a professor at uh, the University of Hamburg, but continues to publish his research, authors, books on meditation and bu early Buddhism and teaches students around the world. And just lastly, I'll mention that Bikonalio has also spent the equivalent of many years in retreat and continues to spend a significant amount of every year in retreat. Bhante, welcome and thank you for joining us. Okay, so I thought I'd just start off the conversation and I was thinking that um, an interesting point is both Minjo Rinpoche and Venerable Analio, you both come from two different traditions, but from my perspective, you share so much in common. And two of the most obvious things are, well, first you share the same teacher, right? The Buddha. And uh, secondly, you both seem to really have a love of meditation and retreat. So I'm really happy to have this dialogue um, between you both. I think it's a very special uh, event that we're hosting here. So thank you for joining us. And given this commonality, though, you know, with the same teacher and a love of meditation, I thought we'd start by asking um, Venerable Analio actually to share a little bit from the perspective of early Buddhism and in terms of what can we say about how the Buddha meditated? Well, I very much appreciate us getting into the topic of meditation, but if you give me that question, I have to do a very short academic detour to just set the situation. Uh, we do not know for certain what the historical Buddha said and did. We only have textual reports from later times. And the area in which I'm working, early Buddhism, the early discourses excellent in Pali, Sanskrit, Gandhi, Chinese, and Tibetan only allow us to reconstruct what people thought the Buddha did and taught and practiced about two centuries after his life. So any kind of statement I might make about the Buddha is a conjecture. There's a fairly high probability that these textual sources, which I just have there standing behind me, are leading us fairly close to the historical Buddha, certainly closer than other later traditions. But we can only talk in terms of probabilities where we can be certain as what the Buddha did not teach. So what the Buddha did as a meditator, I mean, there's two, two things come to my mind. One would be the meditation leading to his awakening. But perhaps more interesting would be the smaller discourse on emptiness, because that really ties in with the trajectory I hope we will be taking in this discussion. So which of the two would you like me to take up, Dania? Let's start with the first, because I think we're going to definitely go deep in the second as well later. OK, so the account of the Buddha's awakening where we have like a range of sources. And so we are pretty sure that this is relatively close to what historically happened is that he had uh, earlier practiced these immaterial spheres, not found them to lead him to awakening. Then he's done these ascetic practices, found they also did not lead him to awakening. And on the night of his awakening, he practiced the four absorptions. 
Then he recollected his past lives. Then he developed the divine eye, which is seeing the passing away and re-arising of other living beings. And then he realized nirvana, the destruction of the defilements. That is just putting it very much into a nutshell. Very nice. And, and I think um, maybe we'll get a little taste of the emptiness meditation as well. And then we can ask Rinpoche to um, sort of compare from his tradition. Yeah, that is actually, I think, the more interesting perspective. This is the shorter discourse on emptiness. And the Buddha starts off saying, I often abide in emptiness. Ananda has remembered that and asked him exactly, how did you do that? And then the Buddha describes in this discourse a gradual procedure of giving attention to emptiness in the form of absence. And it relates very much, I think it relates very much with the type of Mahamudra Dzogchen, Chan tradition kind of practice. He takes it from the actual situation they were living in. And I don't want to go into that, but then he takes up space, consciousness, nothingness, and signlessness. And these are four stages of practice, which is also how I practice emptiness and how I teach it, where we learn to gradually reduce the way we normally perceive the world, deconstruct, debunk the way we perceive the world. Boundless space has this understanding that everything material is ultimately empty. Boundless consciousness has the understanding that everything we experience in our mind is constructed by the mind. Nothingness, there's nothing, particularly no self. And then signlessness, which I think in later tradition is particularly more clearly understood under the idea of amanasikara, non-attention. Coming to a state of mind where you're not attending to anything, where the mind is not constructing or fabricating or making anything, but it's just there and completely letting go. And it's based on this refined uh, state of... Uh, sinusness or amanasikara, non-attention, then, then the breakthrough to liberation can take place. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Rinpoche, when you hear um, this description of how the Buddha might have meditated, uh, how does that resonate with the meditation teachings in your tradition? Yes, I think now what uh, Venerable mentioned, special the um, at the beginning part, how Buddha uh, achieve enlightenment, the process is very similar. And Buddha, in, at the beginning, what we call Buddha was looking for an answer. So there's a question, who am I? What is the life? Where all this come from? So this question is with Buddha all the time, then that becomes stronger, stronger. Then he renounced his uh, um, kingdom and went through many different parts of India and met great meditator and scholar. And le he learned all of them. He's very genius and very quickly he learned and sometimes he's become even better than teacher. But still he's not satisfying. Then he thought, oh, study and little bit of meditation here there may not be uh, I can get I cannot get real answer just by doing that so most important is I have to practice meditation so he spent six years near the river Naranjan and very determined mind practice all these jhanas eight or nine jhanas but still not satisfied in the end he let go so he let go of his very extreme hardship. He let go of even meditation. Let it be as it is. Then in the end, he went to them. When he let it go, then looks like everything is coming together. Then he went to the Bodh Gaya and stay under Bodhi tree and let everything as it is. So then he achieved enlightenment as like a venerable mentioned. And the most important thing is, after he achieved enlightenment, he gave a speech. So maybe I will read in Tibetan um, language. I'm not good translator, but I will try to translate later. Um, 
sulla tenja kor minjurbe me mananda nyu ne braja so can you understand no i'm just kidding <laughs> so what buddha said is i found the dharma like nectar it is a profound it is peaceful it is um, beyond concept it is luminosity it is beyond a uh, cause and condition so even i teach to others no one will understand so i will stay in the forest with silence so that is the main practice of what we call the Mahamudra tradition that we men focus about the the beyond concept with the luminosity profound peaceful nature of our mind so that's the, our main practice so but before that we have foundational practice and then main practice two part and in the foundational practice what we call buddha first try to teach this teaching to his friend five ascetics and buddha give what we believe is there's three big teachings three training wheel of the dharma so the first one buddha tried to give some experiment about the four noble truths so buddha talk about the dukkha and impermanence and non-self so what we call non-self based on not the permanent single independent self then second teaching is the what we call um at the vulture peak mountain but the thought about the compassion buddhicitta and emptiness so compassion is wishing to help others and special wanting to all beings to lead to recognize their true nature so that's what we call buddha nature and then uh, emptiness so not permanent not impermanent not singularity not multiplicity not um independent not independent so the beyond concept but it's not nothing so the essence of that teaching what buddha said the form is emptiness emptiness is a form form is not different than emptiness emptiness is not different than form so then the later of his life what we call buddha give the third big teaching is about the buddha nature that is the luminous aspect of our true nature the clarity and of course that clarity is union with the emptiness so these three main aspect of teaching of buddha that we normally practice uh, uh, my tradition yeah thank you rambache um i have some more questions but i was wanting to give Venerable the opportunity to respond to that, if he, uh, if that um, sparks something for him. So Venerable, anything? Well, I think this trajectory is gonna take us into a direction that I really wasn't going to go so much. I am kind of more interested in exchanging on the meditation practice, but the, I mean, the three turnings of the wheel uh, from a historical perspective, these things look a little different, but I don't know if it is so useful to get into that. You know. So maybe, um, you know, this, this idea that Rinpoche talked about, letting go and uh, this, you know, peace and luminosity, we can get to that eventually. But Rinpoche, maybe you could um, comment on the uh, stages of meditation that was described earlier by Venerable, this idea of, you know, space, consciousness, selflessness, signlessness, so send me or... Ilama Jepa, these, these, these ideas are very prominent in Mahamudra literature. So when you hear them <coughs> talk about this, uh, you know, do you, do you hear the resonance and, and what are these sort of things um, meaning in the Mahamudra tradition? Yes, I think these are the exactly that what we focus in the Mahamudra from the Buddha's teaching. So Buddha taught various different teachings some is <clears throat> excuse me what we call related with the or the relative reality some related with the absolute reality and some depend on the the, the student during that time so the buddha give teaching according to mentality students uh, capacity personality and of course the later the follower uh, followers of the buddha they took different part of the teaching and to practice according to their own personality and 
uh, mentality and the capacity, whatever they connect with the Buddhist teaching. So therefore, look like there are many different kind of type of what we call yanas, schools, and different type of philosophical ideas. But I think in the essence, the basic is same. The all the, the basic idea what the Venerable mentioned, these four things are, I think, pretty much really related with all the teachings of Buddha. Thank you, Rinpoche. I think one way of really connecting these two traditions is to just start with mindfulness, actually. I think this is going to be a nice way into, you know, connecting the two practices. So, Bhante, I, I thought it might be interesting for you to um, define or explain mindfulness from an early Buddhist perspective, because I think we're going to be very surprised at how in the Mahamudra tradition it's, it's, it's quite similar. So if you could start us off with um, explaining from early Buddhism this idea of mindfulness and what it means. That's a question where I should either say nothing or talk for hours. <laughs> <laughs> How could I know? <laughs> yes. What is mindfulness? My best friend, we have been spending so many years together and still I don't really know her, you know. <laughs> yeah, so the understanding of mindfulness again differs in traditions. The early Buddhist understanding of mindfulness is much more of an open, receptive kind of awareness which can coexist with wholesome and unwholesome mental states. <coughs> the entire tradition changes that and mindfulness becomes much more a pointed, almost focusing kind of quality that is entirely confined to wholesome states. And the Sarvastivada Abhidhamma tradition changes this and mindfulness becomes something that is present in every state of mind, thereby becomes kind of fused with attention, with manasikara. But in early Buddhism, mindfulness is something that you have to intentionally arouse. It's not always there. And its most defining qualities to my personal understanding is this presence with what is, without immediately reacting. This openness, kind of like a broad range field of attention rather than a focus. It has a protective dimension because when we are with mindfulness, we are protected. A very important dimension of mindfulness is to be embodied, whole body awareness, just now talking to you, trying to be my whole body. And it is liberating because through mindfulness we see how things truly are. And just as a last uh, lead over to modern day, the finding of my friend Judson Brewer, who's been using mindfulness to teach people how to stop smoking. And they were not able to stop before with other methods. They practice mindfulness, they smoke, they go, this tastes horrible. Why am I doing this? And they stop. That's mindfulness. So we could say, um, you're saying that mindfulness is about awareness of the present moment rather than like a recollection. Is that accurate? The memory recollection, the memory connotation of mindfulness should not be foregrounded in the way it is sometimes being done. I've written about that extensively. And it is simply because we do not really have a particular clear understanding of memory formulated in early Buddhist discourse, but mindfulness is the quality that enables memory. When something is happening, if I'm mindful, I can store it in memory. When I need to remember through mindfulness, I can access that information. But mindfulness itself is not memory. Mindfulness, particularly as a feature of the Noble Eightfold Path, it's very much about the present moment. So Rinpoche, I'm thinking here um, that mindfulness, you know, when it's taught in the Mahamudra tradition, especially when you're doing meditations that are without, you know, a fixed object, like Mikpa, Mikpa Mepa or like a Ten Meh, you know, this, this um, free from reference points meditation. I'm thinking um, that this idea of mindfulness as a capacity to be present does, do you think that resonates, that understanding of mindfulness resonates with the tradition that you teach? Um, yeah, so in the Mahamudra tradition, normally we talk, we call, there's three stage of mindfulness or what I translate as awareness. <clears throat> 
in Tibet, what we call Jemba or sometimes Rigpa. So I translate as awareness. It's much better than mindfulness. So there are three stages. The first is the, the normal awareness or mindfulness. And second is the meditative mindfulness. And the third is what we call pure, in this case, awareness is better, the term pure awareness or mindful beyond concept. So the first mindfulness, the normal one is you no know, people who never learn meditation, people who never even try to understand your own mind, you know, be aware, be mindful. So that is what we call mental event. And this is discussed in the, the Sarvasivasta Abhidharma. So we have Abhidharma Kosha. So there are 51 different mental events. So this is the one. And as like Venerable Venable said, this is the together with all the chittas, all the consciousness, always there. And, and this is, um, some part is kind of related memory also, but the, there's no memory, we have to have this, mind, uh, this, uh, this mindfulness. So this is just that what that mindfulness is actually kind of be present and be with the whatever things whatever perceptions, thought, emotion, whatever comes, being with that, knowing that, knowing the TV now, uh, knowing the screen, and being with my voice. And then second is what we call the meditative awareness. So in the Mahamadha tradition, first we need to, what we call receive the kind of like introduction of that awareness, so in that case, the awareness is become like fundamental quality of the mind. So mind, awareness, mindfulness, consciousness, almost same thing. So here, what we call um, this awareness or this mindfulness has few important co uh, qualities. First is non-judgmental. Second is accepting. Being with whatever comes in your mind, you can be with that. So for that case, everything can be support for meditation. So nothing which is cannot use as object of meditation. So when we be with whatever things comes in our mind, positive, negative, neutral, happiness, not happy, and the neutral, whatever phenomena through eyes, form, ear, sound, no smell from the tongue, taste from the body, sensation in the mind, thought, the emotion, Everything can be support for the meditation. So then eventually we introduce what we call the awareness is like lamp, the candle lamp. So the lamp is the light and the lamp can illuminate itself. At the same time, the lamp can illuminate things around. So if, if you lit the candle lamp in the middle of house full of dark the moment of the lamp is there it illuminates darkness so things whatever things around can see by that lamp a table um, <clears throat> cup wall whatever but at the same time the lamp is the light so you we don't need to use flashlight to see the flame and that is what we call self clarity self luminosity mostly self luminosity and the other luminosity meaning can see can hear can smell can test can uh, tactile and thought and emotion so there's the other luminosity so then eventually we go to the third state of mindfulness beyond subject and object or pure awareness which is uh, being with the mind awareness itself so that is the beyond subject and object, beyond concept. But at the same time, we are not blocked thought and emotion. So everything let come and go, but at the same time, you recognize the essence of that awareness. So that is the, uh, sometimes what we call nature of mind practice. Thank you. Thank you, Rinpoche. I want to um, just you know, help the conversation by clarifying our terms, right? So remember, to, just to clarify, 
um, uh, say, uh, awareness and mindfulness. So I want to ask a question, Shepa and Drempa. Uh, you can have Shepa without Drempa, right? You can have you can have awareness without mindfulness. Is that correct, Rinpoche? Just to separate these two terms. I mean the. The term, what I felt is in English, mindful might be a little bit tight. Next, need to have some kind of object there to be mindful, although you be present. But English word itself, that's what I feel. But of course, I'm not the English expert. But awareness is just present, you know, just like lamp. So it's, it's kind of, there's a luminosity quality there. That's what I feel. Yes, remember, Che, this is awareness. Um, but you can have a, you can have awareness without mindfulness is that correct Rimcha? i just want to clarify these terms for the conversation mm. and and if if it's not correct then yeah please let us know how we translate the jemba or sheba so if translate in tibetan word jemba or sheba as mindfulness then every consciousness has to have mindfulness according to the tibetan mind tradition mm. even the normal consciousness so in we follow this uh, Abhidhamma called Sarvasiva Vasta Abhidhamma. So all the citta has to have these special five mental events that has to go through all the other citta. So one of them are mindfulness. The Kundronga Rinpoche, but Drempa is not part of Kundronga, yeah? Kundronga in Yungenga. Yeah, yeah, okay, yes, okay. So, so so Venerable Nalio, maybe you're seeing us teasing apart this, uh, these words in this tradition. How does that relate to the early Buddhism? Well, you know, what Rinpoche, I, if I understood him correctly, was trying to explain us that because of the framework set by Sarvasevari Abhidharma, Abhidharma Kosha Bhashi, etc., where Smriti, and I'm using the Sanskrit now, is part of every state of mind, then they use that as a basis to develop different understandings of mindfulness that allow you to capture the type of mindfulness that is not normally present in every state of mind. So this is the way I understood him. And this is also why I think he likes to go from mindfulness to awareness, because awareness, as you say, Shepa, it relates to Vijnana, to, to consciousness. And particularly his third stage of mindfulness is very much in the area of consciousness. And Rigpa then is Vidya, Vidya is knowledge. So I, I, I find it very interesting how he expresses what I would consider an understanding that I can very much share, but building, of course, on that foundation that is laid by Sarvasivara Abhidharma. If I look at it from the early Buddhist perspective, I would say that the sati, smriti, is not in every state of mind. And so that would then be what is in every state of mind would be attention, manasikara. It's Yidla Jepa, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that this is the factor in early Buddhism that is present in every state of mind and that explains how memory can happen. Because the Savasthivada Abhidhamikas, they came to this idea of bringing Smriti into every state of mind as a way to explain how memory can happen. That, that is the, 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 the way they talk. And then Smriti is what Rinpoche has described as the second of awareness, this kind of meditative cultivated quality and the third one would then be consciousness, vijnana, shape, particularly if we develop it in the sense of this infinite consciousness, where there's no subject object, where everything comes to the knowing, and where as he so beautifully describes, when you have come to understand this knowing, then you can bring that into daily life situation. There can be sound thoughts, but you're always with the knowing part, and therefore you don't get lost. This is the way how I would build it together. So I think it, it, to me, it made a lot of sense what Mbuchi said. I think we just have to uh, not so much like try to match terms, but try to match what we're trying to say with the terms. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Good point. So then, uh, so then what would you ask Rinpoche, having heard that? What would you ask Rinpoche? I want you to have a, a dialogue together. So based on, based on that and those three types of mindfulness, uh, you know, what do you want, what does that, what do you get curious about when you see that, Rinpoche talk about that? I don't so, really have an immediate curiosity. I think maybe Rinpoche can say something more and then we see what comes up from that. Please Rinpoche. Yeah, I think the Venerable, you are doing a lot of research about the early Buddha's teaching. So 
I'm not expert on that, but when I look at the, the suttas, the, especially the early part of what Buddha taught, there are so many things uh, Buddha taught like Mahamuddha. But then later, when there's a, like uh, Sarvasi Vata Abhidharma or maybe Theravadan Abhidharma or in Tibetan Buddhism, what we call Vaibhashika, Sutantika, so many different um, uh, philosophical school develop. So then they, all of us, somehow choose one part of Buddha teaching and then there's a become according to localized, according to specialized, it has become different. So therefore there's a different term, different name and how to categorize. So the boxes are a little bit different, the, the category boxes. But I think in the general, when we really look at go deeper level into Buddha's teaching, I think the SN is the same. Yes. And Rinpoche, maybe you could describe a little bit of a practice, you know, of mindfulness, and then we can compare practices rather than terms, yeah, or, or share practices. How about that? Yeah, so the practice uh, for the Mahmud term, although we have awareness with us all the time, so the, normally the definition of mind is salshing rikpa, clear and knowing. So the mind always like light. Even you experience dull, you know dullness, you are experiencing dullness, that is the clarity. So whatever comes in the mind, it is a form of clarity, form of awareness, form of the lucidity. But important is we need to connect with our own mind. But how to do that? There's a gradual process. So maybe first we can use the breath as support for meditation. So knowing breath, maybe audience, maybe I will ask you, how many of you are breathing right now? So if you are breathing right now, please raise your hand. <laughs> of course, right? You all are breathing. So that is the awareness, what we call. So as soon as your mind together with the breath, so that is the awareness of the breath. And then for us, my tradition is the awareness is important. The object is just support for awareness to connect with awareness. So then that awareness can be aware of anything. So while you're breathing, while you to be aware of breath, maybe blah, 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 yada, 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 the noise comes, your neighbor doing uh, cooking or construction or traffic or in your mind, maybe you're thinking about the past, future, you can aware of that too. If you lost with the past, ah, be aware of whatever past object or thought, story. And if you want to keep your breath as a main meditation practice, be aware of that for a few seconds and come back to the breath. Then slowly, slowly, everything can become support for awareness, to connect with awareness. So then in the end, we practice the non-conceptual awareness. So be awareness as it is. Awareness, be with itself. Thank you. Thank you, Rinpoche. Are we being with our awareness now? Thank you, Rinpoche. <laughs> Venerable Nalia, when you hear about this gradual practice of connecting with your mind that, you know, can even start with the sense objects, but eventually leads to this non-conceptual practice, uh, do you see any uh, relationship with the, the, the meditation you spoke about at the, the start of this, um, this uh, interview, uh, this conversation around, you know, that started with space? Yeah, first of all, I'd like to really appreciate Rinpoche's very beautiful presentation of mindf mindfulness of breathing. Because in many traditions, it's actually not mindfulness of breathing, it's concentration on the breath. And this is a large difference because people, I was taught to focus on the breath at the exclusion of everything else. And this is actually a way of practice which may be working for some people, but for me, it didn't work because it teaches me to get into this tunnel vision. 
And what I see, if I understood Rinpoche correctly, was this encouragement to have the breath as a reference point, as a support, as a backup for awareness, but not let awareness be confined to the breath, but let awareness be wide open so that anything that happens can be taken within the compass of that awareness. And in that way, then we get a gradual development where at some point we can even let go of the breath and have just awareness being objectless awareness and just resting in itself. And that would be precisely what I see in this uh, Chula Sunyata Sutta, the potential of, of developing a mindfulness without an object. See if Rinpoche has something to add to that. Ah, yeah, very interesting what the Venerable mentioned, the, the Sutta. So I, I don't know what is the translation in Tibetan. I don't know, we, do we have even that Sutta translated in Tibetan or what? So it sounds like the Sutta is very important. Interesting. The so of course, we have. We have it in Pardon? Tibetan. It's, it it exists in Tibetan. It's in the Kanju of Rinpoche. What is the name? In Small Tibetan, do you know? discourse Pardon? on emptiness. Pardon? Small discourse on emptiness. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That is the. Um, we we sometimes uh, take some quotations from that sutta like uh, some teachers taught some teachings or some commentaries, there's some kind of like um, quotations from that particular Buddha Sutta. Yeah, wonderful. I think in, in the essence, the um, special from the meditation perspective, special from the awareness, how we kind of like connect with the our mind and to connect with our true nature. So first we ask question, we look at the self, then we go beyond, then in the end, the mere awareness. So I think that according to that aspect, all the different traditions of Buddha Dharma, I think same. But of course they are like, um, whether there's a Bodhicitta or not, whether there's accepting the Kayas or not, that's a little bit different, a lot of discussions, but the core practice is pretty much uh, similar. Very nice connections here, right? So nice. Brandon Monalio, you were going to say something, please do. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Rinpoche for putting it together so beautifully. And what I also feel we should set aside those uh, category conflicts and rather look at the essence of the practice. That is, that is something really powerful. And in fact, there was one question I had been kind of having on my mind for this meeting. Uh, I have uh, recently read the book on Mahamudra by Gawang Rinpoche, which is based on Boka Rinpoche's commentary on the ocean of definite meaning by the ninth Kamapa on Chukdoji. And under shamatha practices, under tranquility practices, he invites us to use just space as an object. And this resonates very much with my own practice and is something where I would just be very grateful anything that the Rinpoche might be willing to share using space, boundless space as an object to build up uh, concentration, tranquility rather than having the breath or any kind of defined object. Yes, so in that um, uh, the book, the definite meaning of the Mahamudra. So, especially in the Shamatha section, uh, there are many different objects of Shamatha, like um, internal, out, in, uh, internal uh, object, without object. So, one of the without object is space. So, normally what we call the space is very close to the emptiness. So when we look at this, and this, this space is not the science space. So I have a lot of discussion with the scientists. The science space is time, gravity, space together. So let's say if, <laughs> if you talk about the Big Bang, before the Big Bang, the science doesn't know whether there's space or not. But this is space is what I think is even before the Big Bang, 
and this space is beyond time, beyond, um, of course, beyond matter and beyond um, <clears throat> gravity. So it's just openness, un unobstructiveness. So that's very emphasized in the text. So this kind of space, when we look up and down and east and west, there's no edge, edge of the space. Where there's no edge, then there's no center. There's no up, there's no down. There's no direction, no south, no east, no, there's no, so completely beyond. Yet, because of that space, we all are here. Everything is possible. Everything is welcoming. Everything is allowing because of the space. Without space, we cannot have this communication. We cannot have this conversation. So therefore, one of the example of to connect with the emptiness we ha we have the space as analogy. So sometimes we meditate on that, and at the beginning we can focus with a small space through the hole or something. Then the space in front of you, then entire valley, then entire maybe solar system, entire world, or entire worlds, entire universes. So <laughs> according to but this, there is unlimited universes. <laughs> so all this are space, completely open. Yet space is not nothing. Everything comes in the space, stays in the space, dissolves back into the space. Thank you so much, Rinpoche. This uh, creative dimension of space was something I had not been so aware of that was very helpful. I was interested in your beginning with a small hole because that is also the way the Theravada tradition introduces space as an object of concentration. It's part of, I don't know the Tibetan word in Pali, it's kasina, in Sanskrit, yes. Kritsna, mm -hmm. these round objects that you use for the four elements, the four colors, space yeah. and consciousness. Yes, we have that. We have in the Abhidharma, uh, yeah. Abhidharma Kosha. Yeah. So what we call separated things in, so it's casino, 10 yeah. casino, yeah. so colors and the four elements. So sometimes we look at the color or whatever, and then close eyes, memorize the, that whatever color or the earth disk. And eventually you let go of that object. So concentrate on only mental image. Then we make this bigger, bigger, smaller, smaller. And as the concentration becomes stronger and stronger, actually we will achieve the jhanas, first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. So when we achieve the fourth jhana, then you let go of color. Then what happened? You see limitless space. Yeah. So that is the, the limitless space of um, meditation. So I think this is the fifth kasina, I think. So something like that, we, we have that practice also. Yeah, the, it's exactly the same as we have in early Buddhism. But I believe the kasina can also be done at the space without going through all four jhanas, but using the space as the reference point for developing the jhanas, the absorptions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. That's also, this in the Mahamuda, is that's the, directly you meditate with the, uh, space without achieving all these yanas first. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this is my own experience because uh, I, don't, I don't see any reason once I have developed this other type of awareness, as you call it, this more open and not so focused. If I have the object of boundless space as a clear conceptual idea in my mind, I can use that to align the awakening factors uh, yes, yes. thought, sustaining happiness, joy, and unification. And particularly the unification of the mind becomes very powerful because at that stage, when normally when you line up the five factors of the first absorption, when you come to unification, the with other objects, you just experience the mind is unified. But at that point, because the mind takes space as an object, it becomes like space. Yeah. Yeah. You become one with space, you inhabit space. 
Yeah. And this is just, I find this is a very powerful meditative experience. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. So, yeah, in the Mahamuddha. Although, at the beginning, it is the, what we call, concept. Yeah. Of course, you cannot have direct experience of space, but you are imagining space, more like at the beginning. But the later, we can let go of space, so be with the, the mind itself, yeah. as it is, the true nature, the, yeah. the, the real uh, the mind itself. In that moment, and what, what is there is a mere awareness. So that mere awareness is no direction, no up and down, no front and back, no beyond time, beyond matter, beyond subject and object. Yet, all these things can occur there. So you can still walk, you can still see, you can have all this, uh, what we call compassion may come. It will come all the uh, love, awareness, wisdom, all this may arise within that. But although many things can arise within that state, at the same time, that state is totally beyond. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, Rinpoche. Now, I also Thank understand you. that aspect of creativity. It comes from having gone to consciousness, to Rigpa, whatever you call it, and then looking back on the space and seeing that it has the same creative potential on the material dimension. Makes, makes yes. perfect sense. Yes, yes. So that's the, what we call, if you, if you cannot go beyond, then you cannot really fully with the, the, the reality. Yeah. The various reality, as you say, creative reality, whatever life is up and down, dramatic, right? So in order to be with that, first you need to go beyond. When you yeah. go beyond, then you can accept anything in that yeah. level. And in this trajectory that I use from this discourse, then after the stage of consciousness, which you have so beautifully described, the next step then is to take out any sense of I, me, and mine. Oh. Going from space, I have already dis dissolved the material world. But as you rightly say, there's still the concept of space. There's still an object. If I come yes. to consciousness, object is gone. Yeah. There's only the subject. Right. Or if you like, the subject takes itself as the object, however you want to call it. But at that yeah. point, there could still be a sense of I, me, and mine. I am the meditator. I own this experience. And yeah. this is the next yeah. thing that we have to, have to drop off. Yeah. Yeah. So the, what we call the, the innate quality of the mind is beyond concept, of course, beyond time and matter. But at the same time, what we call that is one with the, the awareness, luminosity. And that luminosity is not the thought, not the emotion, not the chitas, not the um it as the mental factors yeah but it is base of everything so the problem sometimes is that is too easy and too close so we what we call too easy therefore become difficult <laughs> too close it is just there therefore you cannot see it we are looking something you know always want to hold on something Yeah, this always wanting to hold on something is then the, the last step in this series after even letting go of I, me, and my making, there is still the idea of emptiness. Yeah. And even yeah. that has to be dropped. <laughs> to, <laughs> that needs to be chucked out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if I experience emptiness and I latch onto it, I miss the yeah. show. Yeah. So also concept about non-concept, so also holding <laughs> an idea. So the only way how you can let go is let it be as it is. Let it yeah. be with your fundamental quality of the mind. So then it's like lamp. So lamp is the light. No need to flash light to, lit, to see the lamp. No need subject and object. Lamp is the light. So that is the 
what we call real meaning of go beyond subject and object. But otherwise, sometimes we let go, no subject, object, no subject, object, no subject, then we make more subject and object. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes all a lot of sense to me. And then the last step is really this uh, stepping out of the very basic act of the mind of processing experience. Because the way I understand is uh, emptiness is a call for emptying the mind from defilements. And to empty the mind from defilements, I have to understand how my perception is creating the world and adding all these little comments, biases and evaluations in the way how things seem to be coming in. And by stepping out this Amana Sikara, this Yitla I think yeah. is in Tibet. This, yeah. is, this, yeah. is, this is the experience itself. You cannot even talk about it because it's totally non-conceptual. And yeah. it seems to be like, why are you doing this? There's no wisdom there, but there's a misunderstanding because the wisdom comes from the experience of what it is like not to be fabricating. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So normally, whatever we use, we need to use one of the five skandhas. Yeah. So maybe the third, the concept of perception. So with this, there's an image, there's a voice, there's sign, then the first one, the second one has feeling that has the, with the sensation, and there's always subject and object, then the, 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 for the mental pattern, and the last is stream of consciousness with the connect with all this. So using those, try to grab using those is quite difficult, I think. Mm -hmm. So in the moment I said, trap. But of course, in order to you drop, first you have to know about what is impermanent, yeah. what is um, uh, non-self. You have to know what is the dukkha, and you have to know what is the emptiness. And then you have to know all well, some of the shamatha meditation, all this you have to go yeah. through. So what we call the best meditation is non-meditation. But in order to learn medita non-meditation, first you have to learn meditation. Yeah. Then you let go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it takes a lot of preparation, gradual building up in order to be able to really abide in this condition in such a way that it is beneficial. Yeah, yeah, that's totally yeah. right. But there is this, what I usually like to bring in, there is this, basic practice of being aware of absence. Like, as you say, the fact that you and I can talk to each other if we were in the same room is because of an absence between us. Yeah. Well, I can see yeah. my mind right now. I'm not angry. I'm totally happy, actually, to be talking with you. There's an absence of anger in my mind. Yeah. So there are these little tools how I can bring in that flavor of absence into very daily, normal kind of things. And in that way, kind of build a launching pad for <clears throat> the deep experience of total absence, which is the healing yeah. agenda. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. I think that that practice is very interesting. So in Sarvasi Abhidharma, of course, the Mahamudra <coughs> practice is not the, uh, the Sarvasi Abhidharma tradition. But of course, the Mahamudra Abhidharma also ex uh, respect the Sarvasi Abhidhamma, and we have graduated to practice step by step. But in the Sarvasi Abhidhamma, the cessation, so there's two kinds of cessation. One is the knowing the nature of reality through wisdom, then you get, you liberate from the craving, attachment, ignorance, then the, then the nirvana slowly, slowly will achieve. But there's another cessation, the nirvana, or cessation, mainly cessation, which is just absence. It's, it's just absence that because there's no cause and conditions uh, arise there, and yeah. it's because there's no constant condition, you not particularly go beyond that, but it's just beyond for you. <laughs> Yeah, that is a problem we sometimes have with meditators. They get sort of like a blank out. 
and then they think they're, they've, they've gotten something. <laughs> and it's yes. very difficult to explain to them, no, you didn't get, you missed something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If mindfulness is not there, how can it be beneficial? Yes. Yes. Mindfulness has to be always there. Yes. From the simplest to the highest. If yes. there's no awareness, then... Yeah. So how about the time? I'm mean, right on time for Q&A. So, but, but this discussion was absolutely amazing. I knew asking you to come into dialogue would be great, but this, was, this has been completely above and beyond all expectations. So I wanted to offer the opportunity for you guys to um, keep, keep talking about meditation if you'd like. Um, and we can get to Q&A later. I saw, I'm sure no one will complain to me. So if there's something more you want to talk about meditation, we can go there or we can go to the question and answers. It's up to both of you. I leave it up to Rinpoche to decide. The, what is the original plan is almost a break, right? Yeah, so we can have a break now and then come back for Q&A. So Rinpoche, we can yeah. do that. So five minute break then everyone um, will be back with uh, answering your questions. Please ask your questions in the Q&A panel below. Thank you, Rambachay. Yes, Thank you, Venerable. So you win five minutes. Most welcome. We're going to have five minute break and after we come back. So let's see if, if also Venerable, if we, we continue to discuss, we can also continue to discuss. Perfect. Perfect. See you in five minutes, Rambachay. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, I think now Daniel is in the absence of the the Nirvana. <laughs> you got the wrong cessation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what do you think, Manuel? Should we discuss more, or I think yeah. we can discuss more? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anything that uh, uh, you would like to discuss about meditation? So I have one question for you while you're doing the research. So did you find any? that uh, normally you are not expected, you know, somehow the Buddha taught at the beginning, like everything, and then how the, the essence is there, but of course, and you did particular research after Buddha passed away within the, two, two, the 200 years, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's uh, there's uh, there's a lot of things I found that uh, changed, and one of the most important uh, from the viewpoint of what we are discussing now is this changing understanding of mindfulness of breathing, which made me mm -hmm. so happy when I heard you talk about mindfulness of breathing because when we look at the earliest level, it is exactly what you what you describe mindfulness. Not concentration and the breath is just a support in the background for us mm. to be aware of what's happening and in the mm -hmm. actual instruction it has 16 steps that the buddha leads us through to to work oh. in this way and i have been able to show about textual developments how they reduce the 16 to 4 to 2 to 1 and then it's just mm -hmm. focusing on the breath ah uh -huh. and so yeah sometimes it's, it's like the focus becomes just the one, the first one, and then not emphasize the other 16 part, right? The exactly. rest part. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, and, and yep. this is the way I was taught mindfulness of breathing when I was a young monk. And the problem was that I am, I'm an anger type. I very easily got angry. It's much better right. now. But <laughs> the more I was meditating, the more I was getting angry. All right, right, right. I yes. was like, what's happening? It's, it's the opposite of what should be happening. But now I understand because I was focusing always on the breath sensation here, I right, was teaching right. my mind to get into this tunnel vision. Right, right, right. And this is what happens when I get angry. I get this person and then I get this tunnel vision. Go, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> right. Yeah, so in Mahamudra tradition, what we call the breath is just uh, reference points as you beautifully describe. And at the same time, what we call the Four Noble Truth. So we need to remember how the Four Noble Truth also practice while being with the breath. So accepting the, the reality as it is. So this is a really important, like the um, deep breath, shallow breath, tight breath, relaxed breath, up in irregular breath, doesn't matter, just natural breath. So that is the, what we call the beginning of development of wisdom. So wisdom meaning knowing the uh, reality as it is. So if we can be the breath as it is, it's developed wisdom. And at the same time, we are not trying to block other thought. So thought, emotion, sound, blah, 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 yada, yada, and normally I make a lot of jokes. That if the pizza comes, welcome pizza. And welcome pizza come, welcome pizza go. But the important is, as long as if you still remember the breath, it's okay. The point of the concentration, point of the samadhi, or of mindfulness is being with the breath. So if you remember the glimpse of the breath, whatever, blah, blah, yada, yada, it's okay. But the, as soon as if you say, cannot think pizza, no any other thought, only breath, then what happened? We think about pizza. <laughs> and not only one pizza, three pizza, four pizza, ten pizzas, you know. So then, so accepting the other thought, mistakes, blah, 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 yada, 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 is what we call the beginning of letting go of aversion. And then being as, as it is, good, bad, doesn't matter, 
This is the beginning of letting go of craving or desire. So just with the breath, we develop wisdom. And then that wisdom is the beginning of letting go of ignorance. And at the same time, we are letting go of aversion and craving. So knowing breath as it is, is the beginning of knowing the suffering and letting go of these uh, three poison, aversion, in craving, and ignorance, is the abandoning the, the cause of the suffering. And as we let go of cause of suffering, then the cessation follows. And the continued practice, continue to be with awareness, continue to be with awareness, the path. So these are really important that we are normally emphasized. It's so beautiful, Rinpoche. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> and this is this is exactly also the end of Sutta. That is that is the original idea. Mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, there's there's a part of these sixteen steps. It's in the in the second tetrad. Four types of four. So it starts off with joy and happiness, because it gives that that the development of the natural joy, of being in the here and now, keeps the mind right. joyous. And then experiencing what's happening in the mind. Right. And just letting it happen. Let the, let the pizzas come and go, as you say. But as you keep letting the pizzas come and go, as the pizzas no longer impact on my mind, the mind naturally becomes quiet. Mm. And I think this is important to emphasize because sometimes we get the criticism, well, you just let the mind run around and you're just daydreaming. That's not the point. The point is, as you so beautifully demonstrated with the Four Noble Truth, if we are with the breath and aware of the thinking, then at that point, we don't need to stop the thinking. We can just sit back and let it move by. And as long as we don't identify with it, we are not caught up in it, it can't do any harm. And when the mind, this is what the mind always does. Now, why does the mind talk so much? Because it always wants to be from, I'm here, I'm in charge, this is mine. So if I say, no, not yours, no, not mine. The mind goes like blah, 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 blah. And the mind becomes naturally quiet, yeah. naturally calm, settling in itself. And this is precisely where then we can experience the mind as such. This is the next step in, in, the, in the Anapanasati Sutta, in the, in the discourse. Mm -hmm. The mental formations are being experienced. They naturally come. And then you experience mind as such. Wonderful. Wonderful. All the tradition comes together. <laughs> okay, so now, Daniel, are you here? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> so so um, did we want to do Q&A now, or is there more to talk yes. about? Yeah, okay, Q&A. Yeah. Let's do Q&A. Okay, so we have so many questions. We're not going to get through them all. I apologize to everyone, but we will do a sampling of questions. So um someone's asking about the roles of shamatha and vipassana in the two different traditions so Rinpoche, why why don't you talk about shamatha and vipassana in the mahamudra tradition and then we'll um hand it over to venerable yeah so normally in the mahamudra tradition at the what shamatha learning is we are how to say try to develop the practice of being because whatever we do in everyday life, we're thinking, we're doing, even you are very smart, but you're thinking, even you are learned, <coughs> learning something. But then there's another aspect of our mind is the being. So you don't need to think. You don't need a particular thing. I mean, the thought comes welcome, but you're not block thought. And you're not doing more like being. So you can be with the breath. You can be with the visual object. You can be with the sound, smell, test. And you can be with the thought. You can be with the emotion. So that is the what we call shamatha. But <clears throat> and this shamatha is um, mixed with the Mahamudra style shamatha and Abhidhamma style of shamatha, shamatha. But the Abhidhamma style shamatha in the Tibet is at the beginning, the focus is the 
conceptual uh, image, so mental image more like like um, casino this or the image of the breath, more like conceptual level, not the reality at the beginning. So then we get the jhanas. Then in the end, you try to explore the nature of reality. So the what we call vivashana, meaning seeing directly, the seeing the nature of the real reality as it is. So, and that is not focused on the conceptual level. It's the main object's reality and explore nature of reality. And for that, of course, first we practice according to first teaching of Buddha to go beyond single independent and permanent. Then second teaching according to teachings emptiness, go beyond everything. The according to third teaching of Buddha is the nature of mind, sometimes what we call Buddha nature. So there's three different layers of Vipassana. Thank you, Rinpoche. Bhante. Yeah, in early Buddhism, tranquility and insight are qualities. They are not separate as they have become in some exegetical traditions. So it's like you do a certain thing in this way, it's tranquility. You do it in that way, it's uh, the insight. For example, the breath. If you are aware of the concept of the breath, you're doing tranquility. If you're aware of the physical sensation of the breath, you're doing insight. But in uh, early Buddhist thought, it seems more like tranquility and insight are qualities that can sometimes interrelate. And we have this idea of interrelation in, for example, in the discourse I've been referring to so much the Chula Sunyata Sutta, the smaller discourse on emptiness, which takes perceptions that belong to the realm of shamatha, of tranquility, maybe of the immaterial spheres, boundless space, boundless consciousness, nothingness, but uses them for the production of insight. And we have another discourse, uh, Ananja Sapaya Sutta, in the discourse on imperturbability, which uses perception from insight for the cultivation of tranquility. For example, the perception this is empty of a self and what belongs to a self can be used according to this discourse for attaining the third immaterial sphere and the sphere of nothingness. So we see here a very fruitful interweaving of tranquility and insight, not mushing it up into one thing. They are separate, but they can interrelate and support each other. And the final goal in Nirvana is you know, Sabasankara Samatha, is the tranquility of all fabrications. Thank you. Um, so we have another question, and Bhante and Alia, this is, uh, I think, directed towards you. Uh, you mentioned um, Amaniskara, Amaniskara in, when you were talking about signlessness, Animita, and they wanted to know the connection between these two, signlessness and Amaniskara. There are two conditions for the attainment of uh, sinus concentration. And one is sabha nimitana amanasikara, amanasikara non-attention to all signs. The second is uh, animitaya dhatuya amanasikara, attention to the sinus element. This is two complementary ways of saying the same thing. But if I bring it down to practice, and then I would really like to hear what Rinpoche agrees with my understanding, is like if I abide in sinusness, uh, there is the natural tendency for the mind to, to want to, to do something, recognize, activate, get something here and there, and it shall have to, have to let go. I have to not attend to what the mind normally attends to. And this is a non-attention to all signs. I see what uh, Rinpoche has to say. Yeah, I think uh, uh, in, in the Mahamudra tradition, the same thing, what we call, like in order to, so what we call this, uh, the luminosity, so awareness, mere awareness. But that mere awareness, in order to be with that, you have to go beyond. 
So only with awareness, then as you said, it may, there's a lot of pop-up thought, emotion, perception, many, many, many varieties, and you have no control. And you, soon you will lose. So you need to go beyond. But the beyond meaning empty, nothing. That is not the, the true nature of ourself. So beyond yet there's clarity. So what we call emptiness, union with clarity. So in that moment, you're free. You're not stuck with any other side. Thank you, Rinpoche. Rinpoche, there's a question around what is the difference between shamatha without support and awareness of awareness? Kind of same, but uh, shamatha without support is resting mind as it is. In that, po that point, what we call shamatha, if you practice only shamatha, meaning in that moment, you are not recognized the nature of that um, mind. But somehow we just being, we just rest. We don't know who's resting, how resting, what is the nature of the rester, and what is the consciousness essence? You don't know emptiness. You don't. You don't learn any go beyond being. So that it has ignorance, but the subtle level of ignorance. There's no wisdom arise yet. But when you explore the nature, then you rest. Then it become really the third awareness. Awareness beyond subject and object, beyond concept. So. Awareness of awareness, it doesn't mean you are thinking about the thought, you are thinking about the emotion. You are being with the clarity aspect of mind, you are being your mind as it is. So that case is the same, the open awareness and the awareness of awareness, same thing. Bhante, I saw you nodding along. So it sounds, sounds familiar? It makes a lot of sense, of course. I mean, if you just have boundless space, but you don't know the nature of the mind, then you will just be reborn in this field of boundless space. No? <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question is around um, compassion. So Bhante, how does compassion and meditation on compassion fit into these types of meditations we've been talking about? Oh, absolutely crucial. I'm so glad this is brought up. In fact, my, my way of teaching these practices, I always want them first to go through the four Brahma Viharas as a foundation. And emptiness without compassion is an impossibility if you really understand emptiness. And if you think you have emptiness without compassion, you're not having emptiness. Because there is this, I, 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 compassion and the Brahma Viharas is absolutely crucial because it's all about opening the heart. And I have this, this image, like uh, a compassion and emptiness are like two sides of a coin. And so as we practice and practice, they come together. We can really see when there's compassion, emptiness is just on the other side. But as we keep practicing, the interesting thing is they start to interpenetrate. And there comes a point where you cannot tell them apart anymore. And where I practice more emptiness and I become more compassionate and vice versa. And at that point, you have to get this union. And this, if you try, I mean, I'm a very weak fella, you, but this, you can't separate. This one, you can still pull my hands apart. But when this happens, you can pull any place. You will meet just compassion, emptiness, emptiness, compassion. But I am just uh, not really, a, I think Rinpoche can talk about this topic much better than me. Very nice. Thank you. Remember, Che, emptiness and compassion. Can you please say a few words? Yeah. Thank you. So in the Mahamudra tradition, so we emphasize about what we call basic innate goodness or the Buddha nature, the true nature of all of us. So our innate qualities. So for the innate qualities, there's awareness, there's a love and compassion, there's a wisdom. And these three are inseparable. So here wisdom is, the ultimate wisdom is recognition of emptiness. 
and that emptiness together with the compassion of course at the beginning they are look like separate and some people they stuck struggle to practice look like emptiness is more like nothing and compassion with like beings there i want to help so at the beginning a lot of conflicts but eventually like what is the essence of love and compassion there's a wishing to be happy so everybody want to be happy isn't it so how many of you want to be happy raise your hand <laughs> in general everybody want to be happy and that is the essence of love or loving kindness and we don't want to suffer everybody don't want a problem so try to wanting to free from problem or dukkha is essence of compassion and that love and compassion filtered by as i mentioned before the three poisons ignorant aversion craving then become clashes then become the negative cause of samsara but when we look at the deeper level just want to be happy don't want to suffer you about you want to be happy you want free from suffering that is self-love and self-compassion or others want to be happy wish others want to be happy and to free from suffering compassion love and compassion for others so and normally what we call this basic feeling feeling is right now right here with us all the time why you come to join this uh, course you are looking for happiness right and while you're listening to my talk each movement of your body is looking for happiness maybe you you're looking like this way maybe you're looking at screen like this way oh this way looking for happiness this way looking for happiness so each movement each eyes blink is looking for happiness each breath is looking for happiness not only that each thought each emotion everything so looking for happiness to avoid the problem so actually everything is infused by love and compassion and this love and compassion is quality of our true nature so for the emptiness our mind is beyond yet there's a clarity what we call and that clarity and love and compassion is inseparable so actually each thought each emotion everything is a manifestation of love and compassion. So therefore, emptiness, love and compassion, actually one. Fire and heat is one. We cannot separate as uh, uh, Venerable mentioned like this. So we have the analogies said, the emptiness, compassion, actually fire and heat, and water and moisture, they come together. Beautiful, Rinpoche. Rinpoche, the next question I think I'll direct to you as well to start with, because they've asked each of the presenters to talk about their views on Buddha nature. So Rinpoche, if you could talk to that first. The Buddha nature, sometimes people misunderstood about the Buddha nature is exist. So Buddha nature does not exist, it's a beyond concept. And also Buddha nature is not empty, not nothing. So Buddha nature is same as empty, beyond concept, yet not nothing. So at the beginning, we have the example about the dream. So dream pizza, let's say pizza. I don't like pizza, but everybody understand pizza. So I give example. So the pizza, the dream pizza is not real pizza, but appear as pizza. But appear as pizza in the dream at the same time is not pizza. So that is what we call Dharmakaya, Buddha nature, Nirvana, enlightened nature. And that is with all of us. So within me, within all of you. So doesn't matter the Buddha, you, all beings, the fundamental true nature is inseparable. Thank you, Rinpoche. Bhante, Buddha nature, what are your thoughts? I just applaud what Rinpoche said. I don't have anything to add. Okay, so maybe you can um, take up the next question, Bhante, and it's on a rebirth. So what did the Buddha say about re rebirth and what's your personal views on the possibility of future lives? 
I would just invite the questioner to get, uh, there's a, a well-known Buddhist publication, wisdom publication, maybe? <laughs> published a book on rebirth by who? <laughs> <laughs> we'll put the link in the chat. I don't get royalties, so I'm not trying to make money, but I'm just saying I gave such a detailed uh, response there that I would much rather like to have another question for Rinpoche or something on the meditation practice now. Okay, so we'll put the link to the book in there. But Rinpoche, can you talk a little about, a bit about your views on Buddha nature? Uh, not on Buddha nature, rebirth. Yeah, so I mean, the, uh, what Buddha said, especially this is according to Mahamudra tradition, mind actually unborn. So the awareness is unborn. If it is not unborn, it is unborn, then you cannot die. So in order to die, you have to be born first. But because we don't understand the unborn nature of ourselves, then what happened? The clarity continued. The stream of consciousness continued, continued, continued. And then according to interdependent cause and condition. So of course I believe the rebirth. And I believe rebirth as relative label, not the absolute. So just like time. So time is exists now in the relative level, same as rebirth. But when you look at the time, you cannot find it. There's no beginning. When you look at the beginning of the time, cannot find. And now present, in between past and present, we cannot find now. And there's no end. So just like space. Thank you, Rinpoche. And then um, Bhante, they're asking, um, this conversation you, you shared about space and meditation on space. Uh, lots of people are very um, interested and curious about that. So uh, Bhante, they were hoping you could explain a little bit more of the details of this uh, meditation on space and, and what, what it involves. Well, uh, and this is the normal way how I lead meditation on emptiness. As I said, I first want people to go through the Brahma Viharas as a foundation. But when the foundation is set, I introduce the perception of boundless space. And in that context, the important part is more to be with mindfulness or awareness of space and to be have the understanding of what it implies. It implies the deconstruction of everything that is material, of all these value judgments as beautiful, ugly, this color, that color, this skin, gender, just gender. All of these are being put into question. But because these emptiness practices require a foundation in undistractedness of the mind, at this point it is also possible to use the perception of space. And I put in a little footnote, the sutta, Pali, Chinese, Tibetan, very clearly speaks of perception of power space. It's not the immaterial attainment. It's not something that needs the four absorptions. So I can also use this perception of space as an object for plain shamatha meditation. This would then be the kasina practice, the kretsna, the totality. And I would take space as an object. And as Rinpoche said, some might like to start with a little hole. I didn't start with the hole because I didn't like that. <laughs> and I had a very clear perception of space. Or so you can look up in the sky, just any kind of this idea of space and then use that awareness of space as the object. And starting with directing the mind to it and staying with it, first staying again. And every time there is a distraction, thought, sounds, allow these to be dissolving in space. The mind goes, uh, I can't do this so nice as but it goes, pizza, 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 pizza. Then you put space around the pizza, no problem. And this is just like a preparation for later on coming to the nature of the mind, but just with this space kind of work. And then if you have uh, 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 Vitaka and Vichara, the initial and sustained applications, by being in the present moment, naturally joy arises. 
And when there's joy, there's happiness, the contentment of being in the present moment. Because you've already got four jhana factors. And then the fifth one is the most intriguing one because the unification comes when you realize that the whole space being attended to by consciousness, consciousness become space-like, boundless, immeasurable. It, it joins with the space, becomes one with the space. So the experience of unification in Panichita Sikakata is particularly palpable with this particular type of object. The initial part is more difficult because if you have a clear focus, it's more easy to know when the mind goes off. But afterwards, on the unification part, it really pays off. I don't know if Rinpoche has anything to, to add to that. Yes, I agree. I mean, the, this is a wonderful way to practice also, and quite interesting. And Rinpoche, they wanted to, you to say a little bit more about the relationship between space and creativity. Yeah. So, and this is the example about emptiness. So if you want to write something on the paper, paper has to be empty first. Otherwise you cannot write because the paper is empty, full of potential there. If you want to calculate, you need to find zero. Without zero, you cannot do calculate mathematics. Or if you want to hear my voice, you have to have absence of my voice. <laughs> Without absence of voice, there's no voice. So same thing, the space is empty, yet everything comes in the space. Everything holding in the space. Everything is welcomed by space. So emptiness is beyond, because of beyond, then there's a part full of possibilities, creativities, potentials. There's a potential, everything's there, but at the same time, it doesn't have inherently existent. So therefore Buddha said, the matter is emptiness. So matter is not exist, but it's not nothing. Emptiness is the matter. And this matter and emptiness are two different things and comes together? No, they are one. The, the form is not different than emptiness. The matter is not different than emptiness. And emptiness is not different than matter. Thank you, Rinpoche. There's a question around the faculty of intellect and the role of intellect in these meditations. We're talking about meditating on space and emptiness and resting. Uh, what about, what's the place for faculty of intellect in, in this type of meditation? Venerable? I'm not sure what the word intellect is meant to say here. Maybe they're talking about the conceptual one? Yeah, I would need to have some clarification because intellect, it could be manas, just the, the mind, but I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe Rinpoche, if you have some idea how to take this question. Mm, yeah. So the intellectual at the beginning, using through reasoning, <clears throat> through sign, through symbolic. So sometimes there's an image, there's a voice, there's some sensation, feeling, three mixed together. So it's concept at the beginning. So normally in my tradition, what we call analytical meditation. So first you analyze, ask question, and try to look for reason. Me, where am I? Who am I? What is my true nature? So there's a sense of me, 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 very solid singularity. Don't want to have unexpected surprise, permanent. Don't want to change. And then there is a independent. I want to be control everything in my hand, independent. Me, very sensitive, touchy, you know, easy to what we call easy to cry, easy to explore, easy to disappear, easy to froze, easy to burn. But that touchy me, how if you can see the nature of that sensitive me, actually the me slowly, slowly, not permanent, it's impermanent, it's changing all the time. And the me has so many pieces, multiplicity. There's a body, 
there's a mind, there's a name, there's a title, there's an activity. What do your friend call me? Your, what do your mother, what do your children, what the society call you? So many different pieces. And these pieces come together independent. So not independent. The mind, the five skandhas, 18 dhatus, so many different things. And they are changing, changing, changing all the time. And then when you observe again and again, again, in the end, you go beyond concept, totally freedom. So there is the emptiness. So in that moment, you rest with emptiness. So now, shamada, vipassana, become one. So you are not lost. Even you ask a question with the mindful, ask a question with awareness, is shamada. But what you ask question is about the, your true nature, about the self, nature of self. That's Vipassana. So they are one. So therefore, in the end, we don't need to lose any, we don't need to use intellectual. So using by intellectual, go beyond intellectual. Thank you, Vimache. Yeah, Bante, thank anything you. to add or, or I hadn't really gotten the question right, but now listening to Rinpoche, I, I fully, fully got the point and it's beautifully put. I just have a little bit, it's like the famous simile of the raft. There's a river, a very strong flowing river, and you can't cross it, you have to build a raft. And the concepts are the raft. We need the concepts to cross the river, but after we cross, we don't want to carry the raft around. But don't chuck out the raft before you have even started crossing the river. Very good advice. <laughs> Wonderful. So next question is, um, Bhante, how do these meditations we're talking about um, help us in every, the stresses of everyday life? But that's the whole point. That's the whole point. It's not about sitting in some ice cube on my meditation cushion. <laughs> How, what would this world be if people knew about emptiness? Climate change, racism, you mean it. How, how do I deal with difficult people? Space, awareness of the mind. I don't see persons, I see just defilements. And I have the same defilements. Let us together get out of defilements. I mean, uh, there, there's just no end for the applicability of these practices to daily life. And that they are crucial. And, and the more I, every time I come, I, every time I do a retreat, I realize what a big fool I am and that I still don't really get it. But when I come out, I still find I'm still better than before dealing with people, dealing with problems, dealing with issues. And that is because the not, the converging point of all problems is selfing. It's the big ego. Here's me. And now you're the big one. And he has to get everything the way he wants. He has to control the situation. Don't get into his way. You're going to get trouble. <laughs> That's the trouble. Here, right here. And if I can see that, if I can smile at that big foolish Anana, you with all his expectations, ideas, wants, wishes, and just go, hey, come on, take it easy. Let it go. So much easier. Rinpoche, can you please talk about the application of these types of meditation to everyday life? Yeah, I think the emptiness meditation is really helped in everyday life, <clears throat> as Bandi mentioned. So when we see the, the, in the multiplicity part, so you, not just single you, you have so many pieces from your teacher, your student, from your student, your teacher, from your parent, your children, from your children, your parent, from your friends, your good person, from someone not you like, you're not bad, you're not good person. <laughs> so <clears throat> when we see all these things, and at the same time, these are related to each other. So you cannot control, everything's not in your hand. Everything's depend on cause and conditions. And special, we are under control by ignorance, aversion, craving, right? So if somebody, maybe you don't like a person, but that person is maybe trapped with the ignorance, aversion and craving, even that person don't like it. 
So when we have hatred, do we like hatred? Nobody wants to be hate. But when the hatred comes, cannot control. Even you are thinking, no hatred, no hatred, boom. Volcano eruption, you know, boom, comes automatically. So that is the wisdom. So the first step of going into emptiness. Then you go deeper, deeper level. When you go beyond, then that touch me. Remember about before that permanent single, as Venerable mentioned, that the world it has to be here, me in my hand. Don't get my way. <laughs> so that is become begin to free. Then when we look at the other people, they are same as us, same as you. And special what we call if we really want to develop love and compassion, we need to practice wisdom. So wisdom is emptiness. Otherwise, when you begin to practice love and compassion to others, and you get their pain to you, and you suffer in the end, and cannot develop love and compassion. So really open our heart, we need wisdom. So wisdom, compassion mixed together. And that are also really good in our life, actually. If you want to be successful, follow with the love and compassion and with the wisdom. Good for you, good for others. Win-win situation. But if you follow that uh, single permanent independent self, the selfish, the egoistic mind, looks like you're winning, but actually you're damaged yourself. You make yourself not happy. You make others not happy. So lose, lose situation. Very nice. Thank you, Rinpoche. So there's, um, I can tell there's questions from some Tibetan Buddhists and questions from some people who have done Venerable Nalio's course. So this is a question for um, Bhante from the Tibetan Buddhist practitioners. What do you mean by early Buddhism? Um, can you explain that again? And then for Rinpoche after that, uh, can you just tell us what is the definition of Mahamudra? Early Buddhism is uh, what we refer to uh, as the earliest period in Buddhist thought and practice that we can reconstruct with our current means of knowledge. The Buddha and his disciples taught orally. It is impossible to know for certain what they taught, but we have an oral transmission over centuries and through the comparative study of the texts that have been written based on this oral transmission, we can reconstruct the way people thought the Buddha was and taught about two centuries later, roughly the time of Ashoka. So when I say early Buddhism, I'm speaking about the part of philosophy, thought, practice, ethics that is shared by all traditions. It's not something Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana is shared by all traditions. And it's just this first historical period in the development of Buddhist thought. Thank you, Rinpoche, Mahamudra. Yeah, so Mahamudra, there are normally mudra, meaning one way translate as a great seal. So it's an example in the ancient time when the king or queen put the seal on something then has you cannot go beyond that seal so that means everything so example from beginning we develop awareness with the breath and slowly slowly include everything as support for awareness the the form sound smell test thought emotion everything become subject of samadhi I mean, the object of samadhi, friend of yourself. Then in the end, the true nature of everything is as emptiness. So it doesn't matter what kind of phenomena, good, bad, yes, no, right, wrong, the nature of all phenomena is emptiness. So nature of everything is pure, it's beyond, it's totally free. So that is the Mahamudra, meaning everything is not go beyond the union of emptiness and clarity. So sometimes the word mudra meaning emptiness with clarity. So clarity meaning compassion, clarity meaning possibility, 
Clarity meaning thought, emotion, perception, then emptiness. Maha meaning actually union, the great inseparability, as Bande mentioned. Like this, no? So same like that. So it's union. Union of emptiness and clarity. Union of emptiness and compassion. So that's the meaning of Mahamuda. Thank you, Rambuja. So Rambuja, um, there's a question that nowadays with the internet, everyone has access to all different types of traditions. Yeah. So you can, you know, learn from Zen person, Tibetan person. And while this dialogue has been amazing in terms and very clarifying, do you have any advice? Um, obviously, it's very nice to be able to see all these traditions, but are there any advice for um, this like buffet situation we have on the internet? Uh, I think first importance is to flip a coin, you know, which tradition should I follow? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is a very important point that what Tibetan Buddhism does is we practice the essence of what we call S, um, 84,000 of Buddhist teaching. So Pali tradition, Sanskrit tradition, we don't have so much Pali tradition, but the later pa Pali tradition preserved with a different form like uh, Bhaibhasika, uh, Strandika, and we have Ajita Madhar, we have Madhyamaka, which is a Mahayana tradition, and we have Bajrayana like Mahamuda, Dzogchen, Mahamadhyamaka. But we take it, essence of these practice is one cushion. And it doesn't matter which tradition you receive teaching from. So, Maybe some days you learn from the basic teaching, some days advanced teaching, some days impermanence, some days compassion, some days, but everything comes down together. So what I call awareness, love and compassion and wisdom. So all the Buddhist teaching in the end, the essence is awareness, love and compassion and wisdom. So when we take it like this, that way, then we will not confuse. Otherwise, which one better? Which one has more result? Fill up a coin. Or maybe I should go this. Maybe I should learn this. Or later I will try this. Then in the end, you're tired. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you, Rinpoche. Uh, Bhante, any advice for um, you know, learning Dharma in this modern world? Yeah, I think uh, what if I understood Rinpoche correctly, this uh, just indiscriminately mixing everything together and going here and there can be confusing. So I will just go with whatever resonates with the mind and then always check whether it's making me better, whether my heart is opening, what, what is it doing to me? And there's a very beautiful thing I would like to share that just happened yesterday. I regularly go with Joseph Goldstein. He just lives behind here. We go for walks. And he told me that when anybody asks him, what do you practice now? Like, are you doing Mahasi or this or this? He just says, I practice non-clinging. And that just, that was like a transmission for me. I was like, it really hit me. It's, this is the point. What do you practice? Non-clinging. If I have that clearly in my mind, then the tools I pick up to actualize and embody that, that goal are not so important. Let's just all practice non-clinging. Nice. Nice. Passing on the transmission, Bhante. <laughs> Um, so we're coming towards the end of our time and there's a nice question here about this dialogue has been amazingly uh, informative for the audience um, and they're wondering how has it been for both of you so Bante how has this dialogue uh, been for you I'm totally delighted and I would really want to continue in some way maybe teach together or do something else together with Rinpoche And Rinpoche, how, how has this uh, inter, inter Buddhist dialogue been for you? Excellent, wonderful. So, actually, I'm really curious about the, the early Buddhism. So, today I already learned a lot. So, this is um, really wonderful. Actually, what Buddha said the Buddha's teaching is beyond school and beyond religion and beyond sector. So that's what exactly what I feel that now. 
Thank you, Rinpoche. And so just to wrap up, I thought I would um, allow like a, a last few minutes for um, Bante and then Rinpoche just to um, connect with the audience. There's like over a thousand people here and just, uh, you know, some something that's inspiring you um, in your practice at the moment or anything you'd like to say to the audience. So Bante. I think I already shared this non-clinging. I wouldn't know anything better right now to say than just pass on what I learned only yesterday from, from Joseph. I think this is really the key, non-clinging. There's a, there's a sutta passage that says almost the same thing, a little bit more sophisticated. Sabbe dhamma na langave visaya. Nothing is worth adhering to. Nothing is worth like getting sticky, clinging, grasping on. Nothing whatsoever. And my love to all of you. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Bhante. Rameche, uh, some, some final words to our audience before we go? Yeah, for me, uh, I practice entire my life, awareness, love and compassion, and wisdom. So these three are inseparable. <clears throat> and the important thing is these three with us all the time, 24-7 actually. Can you believe that? <laughs> At the beginning, you know, when I was nine years old, I learned this teaching from my father. So I was very happy just being born and there's a teacher and father. <laughs> and he said, nature of you, nature of all the Buddhas, and all beings are same. I thought, maybe me and other beings, maybe dog, my nature and dog nature is same. How come my nature and, and nature of all Buddha is same? So of course, at the beginning, it's uh, not easy to believe, but actually, as we practice along the path, aha, there's always aha. So the real enlightened, the real, the great qualities are within us among us, all of us. So you are Buddha, right now, right here. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of you and to join this conversation. Thank you, Rinpoche. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you to the audience. Um, thank you for all your time. Much, much an honor and much um, you know, appreciation to um, having this dialogue. Thank you so much. And, Good night or good morning or good evening to everyone around the world. Thank you. Thank you.